My name is David Harper. I'm Professor of Limnology in the University of Leicester. Limnology means water science. So you might well be wondering why I am introducing this module on globalisation. The answer is simple. I don't know very much about globalisation. I have no knowledge of economics or politics where you might think the introduction to or the person introducing such a module might come from. The reason I'm here is that the lake where I have been studying for the last 30 years illustrates globalisation with two very, very good examples. And because of that, I started teaching this course to interdisciplinary science students in Leicester, and that's why I'm here. Now, the film which accompanies this lecture about that lake is very, very important to your understanding of the lecture. So if you haven't yet seen the film, please turn this lecture off now, go and watch the film first, and then come back to the lecture. If you've seen the film, then fine, we can continue. So, as I've said, the film is what makes me become interested in globalisation. It's a term which I don't find easy to define, but it is relatively easy to understand and it is widely used. So my definition of globalisation is that it's the transfer of materials or policies or ideas across the world from one country to many, or at least across most of the world. Now the film which I helped to make was not created in order to teach about globalisation. The film was made in order to help people understand why that lake needed to be conserved. The film's about 10 years old. But nevertheless, as I said earlier, it illustrates globalisation very well. And it illustrates globalisation with three different examples. The first one, which is why the film was made, is the use of water to irrigate greenhouses which are growing roses which are sent all over the world for sale to people who want to give them or use them to brighten up their houses. Now that's an international trade and at Naivasha roses can be grown all the year round because it's close to the equator. It's got a 12 hour of light and a 12 hour of day and it's got a temperature which is ideal for growing roses and not too warm to also grow their diseases. And the lake is fresh, so it's a perfect place to grow roses. And there aren't very many places in the world to grow roses or other ornamental flowers, cut flowers, all the year round. So the film was made as an incidental because that lake at the time the film was made was seriously suffering from over abstraction of water not just for irrigation of roses but as you saw in the film or will see in the film for other uses as well but largely for agricultural and associated uses. Now the second thing that it illustrates which the film shows you in terms of the ecology of the lake, is alien species. Now, alien species are a very good example of globalisation, which you may not have thought of before coming to this module, because they are spread by trade, either directly or indirectly. Now, the species illustrated in that film are all spread by trade because they have a benefit of some kind to humans, but all of them are in Lake Naivasha because they have accidentally escaped from where they were deliberately introduced. And that's the big problem of alien species. They get away, they get out of where they are useful. And it's global in its reach. So those crayfish in the lake have been spread from the US and they're widespread across warm belts between the Mediterranean and the equator all around the world. 
The same is true of the water plants. They are tropical water plants that have spread all the way around the globe from Brazil where they initiated, where they grow naturally. The last example of globalisation, which is perhaps the earliest one in terms of how long it's been global, is tourism. You see tourists that have come from Europe and America to see hippopotamus, to see tropical birds, to see those species in that lake environment. So three good examples of globalisation. Now when you've watched the film what I want you to do and to talk about is the benefits and the disbenefits of those particular examples of globalisation to the two main groups of people that are involved. That is to say the producers of the product and the users of the product. Then I want you to think a bit further about those generic examples and how long they have been in existence. So how, how long has tourism been a global phenomenon? So that you can link the word tourism with the word globalisation. How long has trade been global? And how long has the spread of aliens been global? And I think you'll agree that the oldest is trade. And you might be picky, you might say, well, there are examples of trade going across three continents, but not all the continents of the world. So perhaps we can just say, well, let's call it global if we look back in time, if it was going across three continents. So what I'd like you to think about next, which is, if you like, the second part of this module in three parts, is what was traded in past examples of global trade and how far it stretched. I think you'll come up with several examples that you can take back hundreds and some you can take back thousands of years. So that makes you think, well, how far back do we go before we don't really like to call it global. If you think about ancient trade routes, say between Asia and Europe, can you genuinely call that global? If you think about ancient civilizations, particularly those that had their centers around the Mediterranean, they traded, they also conquered in three continents, if you think of Europe, Asia and Africa. So think about globalisation or, or global issues in terms of what went on 2,000 years ago, as far as maybe three or 4,000 years ago. And if you think about those three continents, and if for the sake of argument you agree with me that globalization can be three continents, then try and think about what the most ancient commodity of globalization, of global trade was. Now, if you go back to the beginning of the lecture and to the modern examples of globalization in the film, tourism, um, trade and alien species, what I would like you to do in the final part of this module is to think up other examples and try and think about how globalization has a part to play in the concept of a sustainable society. Ask yourself whether or not those three examples are sustainable and whether the benefits of them outweigh the disbenefits. Now, I'm sure there'll be some of you who might think that the global trade in flowers has no place in a sustainable society. Others might think it does, 
there is a case, uh, an there is there is an examination of the carbon costs of flower trading, which shows that growing flowers in greenhouses in Holland is more carbon intensive than growing flowers in Kenya and shipping them to Holland on a jumbo jet. So there are pros and cons of, of both. Then I want you to think about the modern examples of global trade in particular, as well as modern examples of tourism and maybe modern examples of alien species, where the negative values greatly outweigh the positive values. So think, for example, of the ivory trade. There are almost no benefits in the ivory trade unless you see the value of carved ivory, the aesthetic value of carved ivory. But the trade is effectively run by criminals, so it's unregulated and it's likely to drive elephants to extinction before your children are adults. So it's more negative than, very much more negative than positive. So I want you to come up with a sort of short list of what kinds of globalization have a place in a sustainable society. And the last one I want you to think of is agriculture. Currently there is a global trade in crops, especially rice, wheat, potatoes. And that trade is driven by the intensification of agriculture, wherever it's practiced. And I want you to ask yourselves, is that the way in which we are going to feed 9, million, 9 billion people on earth? Or, as some people think and as evidence is increasingly being presented, are nine billion people going to be fed on earth through small-scale agriculture which is producing a greater yield per square kilometer than intensive agriculture with far fewer inputs of that are carbon derived such as fuel, pesticides or fertilizers. And think about things like the Green Revolution in the past and the, the, the current uh, issue, which is genetically modified crops, and think and argue whether or not that has a place in a sustainable society. Thank you for listening. I hope by the time you finish this, you'll get a better idea. You'll have a, a better idea of the issues of globalisation.